All right, here with John Vodenlich, ABC Hall of Famer this year, UW Whitewater, but heading into, I think, 21st season as head coach, two national championships with over 700 winning percentage. So, John, thanks for jumping on with me. Thanks for having me. I just read it, you're an ABC All American, two timer, first Whitewater player ever to be a two time ABC All American. That's what they tell me. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, and I, I'll go on the record now and clean this thing up, but uh, I was a great hitter. And uh, fortunately, at the time when you, when you were comparing stats for catchers, it was, you know, you're going to compare offensive stats. I was a very average catcher, but I could hit it all right. So um, I made it through for a couple of years and got lucky. So. Well, that's why I looked. I mean, I was like, oh, catcher. And then you look at your numbers. I think it was like 390. You hit like 420 one year. And I'm like, that's that's yeah. abnormal at the catching position. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was a good hitter. I was an average catcher. But well, what makes we, you we say don't... you're an average catcher? Well, because I see what's going on in the game now, you know, and I, I you know, I, I was a guy who, who got a sniff for at least some opportunity to, to be discussing pro baseball. And, and, uh, you know, you think I thought I was a, a great catcher defensively until you start really getting into this game a little bit and you watch what's happening at the highest level. So, um, you know, there's no chance I play at the next level as a catcher um, because of my ability to catch and throw. I mean, I was a good catcher, but, you know, when you compare it, what's happening now, it's like it's like night and day. So um, the hitting part was really what, what got me some accolades. Did you catch overseas then, too, or did you play another position? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was a high school shortstop converted to catcher. Um, probably a good conversion, but my high school coach as a senior, I converted to catcher. And then, and then when you get overseas, it's a little trickier than that because they limit how many how many uh, imports you can have in the battery. So if an American pitcher was pitching, you couldn't have an American catcher, and vice versa. So, um, so I played third. I you know most of the time, and and when I needed to, I caught, but. It was okay. By that time in my career, I was okay at third. I was feeling good without putting out the gear. Much of a language barrier for you going overseas to the places that you played in? Not really. Not really. My my my. Um, so most of the areas I was in is former Yugoslavia. Uh, my parents defected from Yugoslavia in 1959. Uh, interesting story. My my mother was an Olympic skier for Yugoslavia. My father was her coach. And and they defected in 1959. So our our language at home was Serbo-Croatian, and and uh, so when I moved into those parts, uh, you know, northern Italy, Slovenia, Croatia, I did just fine. I was able to understand most of it, and that gave me at least familiarity, and I, I felt good. I didn't get homesick because of that. It's tremendous. What are some of the other things you learned when you went overseas? <sighs> well, from a from a coaching standpoint, I'll tell you, man, you can. You can work for the picture perfect swing, but at some point you got to put the barrel to the ball. I mean, the European hitters at that time um, were converting from other sports. So, like I remember watching the Czech team play back then, and man, their swing did not look pretty. I mean, there was no Ken Griffey Jr. in that anywhere in there. Yet, yet, so I was like, oh, this is going to be an easy game. You know, it looks ugly. It, there's not any, you know, prettiness in their swing. And uh, yet they could barrel, they could barrel the ball, man. The hand eye was there. Um, I, I think from the Czech standpoint, it was it was hockey. It's a hockey you know, they piece, all, isn't it? it? It is. I think it is. And and so I think I remember. Number one, don't judge people based on how they look. Um, and number two, even if the swing is not a pretty pretty piece, uh, you could still get the job done. So I, I remember thinking that. And then, and then I also was amazed at all these places that had baseball that I didn't even think or fathom they would have it. And and it's only gotten better since then, of course. Um, the Dutch are playing good baseball. The, the Italians have always played good baseball. The Germans are getting better. The Czechs are, you know, all of a sudden on the map. So um, it was a great opportunity for me to, to see some of those things. But then you ask what what probably I learned the most is is – you know, the, the relationships you build and, and the different cultures was, was ultra interesting for me. Um, cause you meet, you meet a lot of different people with a lot of different names and, and faces and, and customs. But at the end of the day, they're all pretty much the same. Our, our, our commonality was that, that bond we had for the game. We all love the game. 
everyone had a Yankees hat, by the way, back then. You know, so uh, you realize that that's how they learned about the game was was probably because of the the Yankees and the Dodgers. Those are the places that even back then they knew they knew about. And is that introduced by by GIs coming over from America and going over? To yeah, part yeah, of the exactly. Exactly right. If you look at the history of the game in Europe, um, it, it started in the Netherlands. Uh, we occupied that in 1941. Italy, of course, for a long, long time. And then, and then early in my career, I was doing some fun stuff over in Germany, and and you know they had a Ramstein Air Force Base and a couple other places, and all they had their own little leagues, they had their own things going on. So I, I think that was a huge influence. Um, and once again, I'm not a historian in in baseball, but it, it certainly to me appeared that that was where most of the game came from. Is is our influence during World War II? Matter of fact. Um, just two years ago, every third year, I take take our team on an international trip, and, and it's been almost predominantly to Europe. And our last game on our last trip was in uh, Trieste, Italy, and uh, it was they introduced me to the history of the field, and it was called Soldier Field. And right in Chicago, you know, they have Soldier Field, so it was Soldier Field, and it was named such because our uh, our our military built the field as a as a thank you to the citizens of Trieste at the close of World War II. So you can only imagine they, they flew both flags and played both anthems and explained to us the history that were and, and the field looks exactly like it was probably built in 1945. There's been no updates. OK, so so, I mean, it was a lot of concrete and some old light poles and and uh, but what a really special, special place to be. And and it was a great place to, to play. Was the goal always to go back to Whitewater then? No, no. I um, so I I, I followed uh, Jim Miller, who was a legend uh, in the area. was was at our school for thirty eight years, and um, my degree was in business. And then I I got my MBA, and I spent about seven years in the business sector um, because I never thought you could make a living in baseball. And, and and I don't know how old you are, but if, if you're you're a little younger than me, if you're Matt's age, but. Um, you, you certainly remember there wasn't a lot of opportunity. I mean, you know, there's probably a couple hundred applicants for each job and, and you were lucky to have maybe an assistant coach back then. Um, so I didn't think I could do this for a living. And, and, uh, I happened to be working in the area and, and Jim Miller, who was here 38 years said, why don't you just help out, help out when you can keep your foot in the door, keep, uh, keep doing what you love. And, uh, and it was because of that that I that I stayed in the game as long as I did. And eventually, eventually something happened, and I got a, a head job, and and then the rest is history. When I came back here, I, I never thought in a million years I've been back here twenty five years now because I was his assistant for four years before I took the helm. So um, no, you don't you don't you don't sometimes know where things will lead. I definitely didn't see myself as a coach that's going to stay in one spot for that long. Um, but it's a great place to be, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 100% committed to to the purple. So, was there any hesitation going to Edgewood? I mean, their their record was 33 and 133 before you got there. They had never had a winning season before you got there. So, was there any hesitation leaving? Yeah, there there was some hesitation, but let me tell you the two things that sold me. Number one, I was I was pretty certain I could look good when compared to 100 and 100 in, you know, what was it? 33 and 133, yeah, 33 right? And 133. Yeah. Yeah. So if you looked at their history, they had been the last, how many years they were in playing, they were 33 and 133. So I did the math and I said, I, I don't know. I, I think I can do better than that. That was the first thing. And the second thing was, was, uh, it was a full-time job in baseball, you know, something I hadn't had before. And, and, uh, um, and it was a great place. They, they treated me well. I, I really made a lot of friendships there and, and it was a great starting point for me. I did not expect to come back to my alma mater. I mean, at that point in my career, um, I was really happy with where we were at Edgewood. I was, you know, the following year we had a lot of success and we, we started getting some really good ball players in and, and things started to happen there. Um, but then Mills, who had been here for 38 years, he, he called me up and wanted to play golf one day. And that's how it happened. Like in the middle of my, my first whole drive, he, he said, well, how about you come back to Whitewater? And, you know, of course, I, I can't blame him for the bad shot, but 
that that was how it started. And then I came back and I didn't think I'd be here this long, but I've been really happy, man. It's 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 a great place to be. Could you stay in the same house going from Whitewater to Edgewood? I did, yeah, right. So we were so I was I, I graduated, I bought a house um in Whitewater. Um, kind of like I was the original slumlord. I thought that would be a great thing. And and I lived in that house. And then and then I was driving uh south to uh, the Lake Geneva area. Um, and then I got the Edgewood job. So I kept that same house in Whitewater and now I'm driving to Madison. So I always had lived in Whitewater, um, but I was for, for about six, seven years traveling south to Lake Geneva area. And then for another three years, two and a half years, I was traveling, uh, North, Northwest to, to Madison. And then, and then of course he would stop by my house and let's go play golf. And, um, you know, and they didn't have a position when I left. So they created the position for me. Uh, so that made it easy for me as far as, you know, coming back. You feel like you needed those two years at Edgewood as a head coach before you went back? Yeah, I, I think I could have used even more, right? More years than two. Um, I, th- I think I think it was the years I spent away from Whitewater doing something other than baseball I thought was very important. And then certainly – spending years away from my alma mater and seeing how other things had worked in other places. And in this case, Edgewood was a private school. So that was a great, great um, training ground for me as well. So I, I got to see a whole different side. So I think both of those things were very, very in- instrumental to to being able to do my job here. Now, your first season as a head coach, you take Whitewater to the World Series, second time in school history? Yeah, yeah, and I and I don't want to take all that credit because here's the reality of it is I came back and and we we recruited those players together. I mean, I was I was I didn't have the title of associate head coach, but that was our understanding that we were in this thing together. Um he had told me before I ever took the job, um you get me to 400 wins and the job is yours. And then 4 years later, Mill says, "Well, I didn't think it was going to happen that fast." Maybe I don't want to do this. And eventually he he still, you know, fulfilled his promise. And he stayed on then as a non-paid volunteer uh, almost to the day he died. So, um, it, yeah, having him here um, was very important. And, and, for, and once again, my point is that, you know, it, it, it wasn't something I did in 04. It was just we had built a team since 2000. And they were ready to to take the next step, and I happened to be named head coach, and so it was a logical progression of 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 what we had been building for four years. Did you have together. a lot of those guys coming back for the next year, win the national championship the next year? Did you have a lot of those yeah. guys coming back? Yeah, except for except for most of my pitching, I had a better pitching staff, I think, in '04. Um, you know, and you, you look back at all those things, and, and we lost in the semifinal game to uh, another Hall of Famer. I think Holowati was at. Uh, Eastern Central, um, Eastern Connecticut, Eastern Connecticut. Thank you. Eastern Connecticut state. And, uh, they hit a two run bomb in the bottom of the ninth to beat us two to one. It was a one zero game when I brought in our closer and, and, uh, he hit it over the fence and we lost. Otherwise we're in the national championship game that year. And I think they ended up going on. I'm not sure if they won it or not, but, um, but once again, yeah, it was, it was, uh, we didn't have the in in 04 we we had great pitching um and in 05 we had two great pitchers and a great lineup and so a lot of things fell in place most of the position guys were returning guys then won it again in 2014 and i read that too you got whitewater had the trifecta so football basketball and baseball won yeah in yeah and, and what what a lot of people forget um is that in six and then in eight and then 11, we fell short. And then again in 16, we fell short. I mean, so we've fallen short more than we wanted. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, but come on um, <laughs> I, yeah, but, but, but I'm still happy we did. I'll trade you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you think you're, you think you figured it out and, and there's a lot of things along the way. Uh, the home run in 04, you know, eight, there was a bunt. I forget what team bunted it, landed on the outside of the chalk line, but was touching the chalk line. If that bunt goes foul, we'd probably win that game and go on to the, 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 at least the championship game again. So, um, as much as I remember the, the national championships, you certainly, uh, remember a lot of the bruises along the way. 
And that's the beautiful thing about baseball, right? Like, as soon as you think you got everything figured out, like, the game's going to remind you, like, you, you you don't have anything figured out. Yeah, yeah. You stole kind of part of my Hall, Hall of Fame speech because um, I was going to – I plan on starting by simply saying time is is the wisest of all counselors. You know, in 04, I mean, how easy was that? You know, I just showed up and all of a sudden we're winning games and, and, um, and, you, and, and it's, it reminds me of my golf game. Just when you think you got it figured out, something happens, an injury or a critical injury or a critical play that you don't make. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very humbling game. And I think that's why we all, yeah, you included, love this, you know, it's, it's a great, great, uh, great, you know, industry to be a part of. Is golf kind of your decompress to be able to get away from it? No, I, I, I don't golf nearly enough. And, and the reason for that is it's a huge commitment and a huge time. And I, I used to always get over on, on our basketball coach, who was a good friend of mine. He just recently retired. Uh, we won the trifecta together in 14. Uh, and part of that trifecta was also the football coach. And all three of us played here. All three of us went to school together. All three of us took took over for our coaches. And, um, and, I, and he has a great golf game. And uh, he had a couple tough years, and I was like, yeah, well, maybe you should play less golf. So it's always been my, you know, if you're playing a lot of, if you're really good at golf, then you're probably not spending as much time on, on in our, you know, role as we should be. My dad Whether said it's it recruiting all the time. or fundraising. If your golf game's or whatever. good and your lawn looks good, you're not doing your job as a baseball coach. Exactly, exactly. And, and so, so from those two standpoints, or, or from those, parameters i'm doing okay because my wife always says why is the field look why does the outfield look so good and in our home not so much i said well you know that's how it is <laughs> how good is division three baseball in wisconsin i mean for people that don't know i know how good it is but for people that don't understand how good division three baseball in wisconsin talk a little bit about just overall you look top to bottom it's a great state yeah well well first of all i think it's gotten so much stronger across the nation um there's about 400 teams that competed our division and and certainly not all 400 are impressive but i mean when you get to the fir- top 50 top 60 um they all play pretty damn good and uh and our state is really really good and, and of course um throughout the last 30 years you've seen tons of championships won by our league whether it's stevens point or us or lacrosse or or Oshkosh, all of which have been very, very relevant in the last 30 years. So it's a, it's a good game in our level. Um, we're, we're, unfortunately, we benefit from the fact that Madison, the Badgers, don't have baseball. my next question, by the way. Does okay. it help that Wisconsin doesn't um, have baseball? Well, it can't hurt. Right? Yes, for sure. It doesn't hurt us. So, um, and uh, my, one of my former assistants just took over the job at uh, UWM in Milwaukee, and they're the only Division I presence in the state. Okay, and if you compare that to other states, that's pretty good for us. So I think we benefit from the Badgers not having baseball. I think we've had a good tradition in our state. I think part of that came maybe from, you know, from from we used to be part of the Midwest League for many, many years in minor league baseball. So there's always been parks and pro players around here. So there's a good tradition. But, the, you know, it's also true in Minnesota. They play some pretty good. D3 baseball and Michigan has their teams Um, and across the board, the Southern schools have really picked it up. Uh, Southern Western schools have really picked it up when it comes to D3 for many years. I don't think they really had any desire to play D3, but now they're doing a really nice job. Uh, We're going down to see Trinity, Texas, and they're, they're a powerhouse as well. So I saw them um, a couple years ago at the division three. They're really good. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's some, there's some good players. I don't know. Uh, moving forward, I don't know how how the uh, um, you know the new transfer portal is going to affect us, though. You know, because because I think um, uh, the old rules were were more uh, conducive for us building building good good players at the D three level. Yeah, and, the and that's changed. Doesn't want to listen to me. I, I still don't know why you don't have to sit out a, a. It's the student athletes. I don't know why you don't have to sit out a year if you move up levels. I think that should still be a, a rule. But the student athletes have so much power now; they don't they don't want it. Yeah, you know, I, I sometimes um, wonder what we're trying to teach them. And, of course, at the highest level, we're, we're really not trying to teach them anything. We're trying to make money. But at our level, um, I'm very happy to be here because I think we're still trying to teach 
some core values, right? Whether it be loyalty or persistence or, or work ethic or discipline. And I don't think uh, the current portal, portal uh, uh, regulations and, and bylaws really are helping us teach those things. I mean, you know, you just think of it. I don't know. I, I guess at the division one level, it's a whole different thing than what we're experiencing. But I certainly feel that if you're going to move, you know, in the rest of all the other industries, there's no compete clauses. If if you're with one company, you can't just move over to the other company and take your clients with you. So I, I don't think it teaches real world uh, things um, or maybe it, maybe it teaches real world things really well. I don't know. But um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of everything. But you know what? If you're doing this long enough, you got to roll with the punches and then try to see how you can utilize it to your benefit. As soon as it came out, you know, I was still coaching when the portal was was introduced. As soon as it came out, I'm like, you're losing so many growth opportunities. One for players to go have an adult conversation with someone, explain why they're leaving. And then yep. two, you know, for coaches, maybe to learn a little bit, maybe they need to make an adjustment on some things. But I, just, I think we've lost a lot of adult conversations, good growth opportunities on both sides that, that we've lost because of that. We're just making, you know, not that it's ever going to be easy, but it just shouldn't be as easy as it is. Yeah. And, and maybe the NCAA's goal ultimately is, um, is to restructure NCAA divisions to legitimately be, um, those divisions one, two, and three. So, you know, you go to Germany and, and they, of course, all their leagues are set up like Bundesliga soccer is the one league. When, when you're the worst team in the one league, you go down to the two league. And if you're the worst team in the two league, you get, you get, you get relegated to the third league, right? That's how they think D one, D two and D three is right. That's how they think it is. And, and I think, I don't know if this is a goal or not, but certainly this is a step in that direction, right? Because, that would spice one things up, now, though. By the way, to, if you had to get if you got relegated, that would that would spice some things up. <laughs> oh, it would, but it's it's like it's that vision without that right relegation because yes. you know I I don't know how much it helps level the playing field. I I think what's going to happen, you're going to see the cream of the crop at the top is going to be significantly better than the rest of Division One. Okay, and the rest of Division One, I, I think, are going to be all you know fighting for the the scraps okay well, that's where you so add then another what's... championship in and you know my my, yeah. my fear is that those top schools end up just cannibalizing everything and it's one of those be careful what you wish for and you know hopefully we don't end up losing programs and athletic departments as a whole because of it and i, I that's just my concern i can see five ten years down the road where you have some universities just opting out of playing athletics which is not what yeah, it should yeah be. yeah or or i think at a minimum there's going to be an increase of what is now considered division three athletics because there's going to be division one and division twos that just cannot compete at where they are so they're going to have to go somewhere and and ultimately for me that the disappointment is you know everyone has a pecking order and and we're fortunately high on our division three pecking order but man if you're below me you're not very happy if people want to just transfer with no, you know, with no hesitation up or down. I mean, like, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't, I hope the NCAA wasn't hoping that, that division one teams could just come cherry pick all of D3. That doesn't seem like a really good idea, but that's what's happening. Yes. You know, the, the rule before was um, you could still transfer from D3 to D1. You could do the transfer, but you couldn't be enticed financially. I thought that was a pretty fair thing. I don't know. We want all these people, you know, before it used to be under the table. Now it's in the portal, right? I mean, you're basically out there. And and I don't understand it completely and, and holistically how it's going to affect all divisions. Um, but in principle, I think it's a hard thing for me to get behind, even though I always feel that you want this, you want the student athlete to be able to experience um, you know, and meet their, their goals and dreams and aspirations. So, you know, maybe, maybe for some D three guys to get that opportunity to play division one, maybe that was great. You know, maybe that's, that's, that's a, we should applaud that. Um, but I think it's going to take some time until we see how this all yeah. impacts the full game. Do you miss the world series being in Appleton? 
Yeah, yeah, that was they did a really nice job. I think that was um, understood. I think most people agreed with that. Um, but you know what? It, it's also uh, pretty cool for for us to be able to go other states and other places as well. So um, once again, I, I don't think. Uh, and Cedar Rapids you know, was great. They did a good job. Just didn't draw yeah. as well as Appleton did. And I, I think Ohio will be a good switch here too, Lake County. You know, I think yeah, that'd yeah. Be a good switch. You know, if if because the product uh, on Ohio, the field is tremendous. I've been very impressed with the Division Three World Series. You know, with my job, I'm able to travel and go see the the championships, which is part of the reason I love my job. Yeah, yeah. So I've been impressed the the last two years. In Cedar Rapids, you think they've some done of the, a phenomenal you, job. And and I, again, I see a lot of Division One games too. I would put those eight teams up that played in Cedar Rapids the last two years. They can go beat Division One schools easily. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you think some of the the um, the attendance numbers though probably were skewed a little bit? Because if you're in, you know, if you're in Wisconsin and you got one or two Wisconsin teams in it, all right, you know that's going to be a bump. I think. One of the years we won, there might have been, we had about 4,000 fans and Emory had about 200, you know. So on those days, that's not something that commonly happens. So hopefully when you, when they get down to, to Ohio, some of those it's Ohio great teams division, end up. Three state. Yeah, yeah. So they get in there, you know, maybe you'll see a bump in attendance as well. Yeah. Have you always kept your roster size around 34-ish? Yeah, it was it was uh, it was thirty, and then it went to thirty three. Um, I would love it to. I would love there to be a division three standard across the board. Um, I think division one maybe has that at thirty five. I would love to see that because it, it then does it takes the decision out of our administration. Um, because of course, at a lot of places, they're using it as a revenue producer for tuition and fees, so they 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 might carry. 50. Um, and, and I just don't think that's really fair either. So, um, but yeah, we've been always between 30 and 33. And you said you have a, a, a mix of Illinois guys now too. look like Texas and Florida sprinkled in when, when did that start to change? Cause was it primarily a lot of Wisconsin kids early on and then. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, kids it, in too? it, it, I don't know exactly when it happened. Um, it's been around for at least 15 years, maybe longer, but I know why it's happened. It's happened because in Illinois, uh, prices of higher education is through the roof and their D3 options are only private, which means they're mostly small schools. So when you look at, well, I could go across the border for less money than I can stay in state and I can experience a middle-sized school, those things have benefited us. Um, and unfortunately, it just it's a tough situation for those in Illinois because of all the reasons I mentioned. So I, I, I don't know if that was, you know, 15, 20 years ago that, that those things changed drastically, but um, it's been like that ever since. About 45% from Illinois, 45 from Wisconsin, and then 10% from all the other states combined. Do you like being at D3 because it still does kind of balance the academic and athletic piece out? Um, I wouldn't put it that way, but yes. Like, okay. I think there's something special about me not having a conversation and trying to trying to put a dollar number to your worth. Everyone on my team is worth the same amount of money. Whether I, I don't give you scholarships. We're here because we want to be here. And you know what? Ultimately... Many of our guys are playing less than they would be if they were getting a 40% ride somewhere. So so they, they're paying less than they would be anywhere. And I don't have to have the conversation about, you know, NIL money or, or, or all of that. And then because of that, we can start having conversations about values. Um, so, so for me, it's about the pureness of the sport. Now, I don't think you ever have to um, – sacrifice either your academics or your athletics. I think those two can co co coexist. I don't know you can also join a fraternity, sorority, party all the time and have three girlfriends. I don't know all that can happen, but I do know that you can you can do a great job in the classroom and you can you can be a, a champion on the field and 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 we can teach I think principal lessons about life. So yes, I that's why I'm happy about about where I'm at and and um, if I ever move, you know, to any other division, 
you know, I'd have to try to figure out how I feel about it. And I'm sure, I'm sure some of the greatest coaches already above me have figured that piece out. You know, I would guess if you talk to Corbin and he's probably already There's a lot understanding. Out there, it's not different. It really isn't. You know, you still have to he's be still good teaching. at both at every yeah. level. Like you, and if you want to yeah. be good on the field, you need to be good in the classroom too. You have to, like, right. you have to try to excel right. at both. It's, it's a yeah. lifestyle yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 You know, how did you raise expectations at Edgewood? Edgewood? I mean, that couldn't have been easy getting there. You know, I know I, your expectations maybe have been different than what the players' expectations were. How did you change those expectations? Yeah, I, th I think, um, hmm. well, first of all, I think expectations change with progress, right? Um, you know, and I'm trying to come up with a great analogy for you, but um, if you've never won more than five games a year and then all of a sudden you win 10 games a year, well, all of a sudden the new standards, 10 games a year. So, so progress and how you define progress, I think is the key, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be the wins in our case, it, it translated into wins, but, but you know, I think probably for some of our players in the first year, progress to them was, wow, we got some pretty decent uniforms for the first time ever. That's progress. Um, we're traveling better than than we've ever traveled before. Our practices are more organized than that. So, so it, it all depends on how you you structure it and, and how you define progress. But I do think when you show progress in whatever parameter you you teach, um, I think it's easy to get on board and keep pushing things forward. And so, were those those that that those conversations you had with those guys at Edgewood's like, okay, here's what we've been. Here's what I think we can get to. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of conversations like that. I think I, I, you know, as a staff, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of, I, as a staff, we did with the players. We didn't, um, with the, with the players. I think what you're really looking for is you're looking for players that are committed, you know, to sticking it out, and to give them their best effort. And if you have that kind of person, the skills, the skills will come. I mean, in the initial phases, you're just trying to create baseball players. I mean, let alone a guy with any of the five tools, you're just, you're just looking for a baseball guy, right? A guy that loves the game. So, so I think, you know, in the initial phases, maybe you look at it as a, as like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs before, before we start talking about any of that self-actualization up at winning championships, you're just looking at people. Can you just put on your glove the right way and your shoes the right way and, and play the game the right way? And if we have guys that are committed to playing the game the right way, then the results kind of take care of themselves. Um, and quite frankly, I was young still then. And so, you know, I don't know. I got to give all the credit to those committed athletes. I think, I think when I got there, we had 15 players and we ended the year with 12. And then the next year, of course, I, I had the whole year to recruit. And, you know, I think our roster was up at 26 then. And uh, and I think we were maybe 19 and 17. So all of a sudden now we, we had made a major step, which is the first time ever we were over 500, um, which, which of course changed and mostly with freshmen. Right. So, so but yeah. Even I that think, year before think, you guys still finished third, which probably yeah, never right. happened at Edgewood, even the year before you, you still found a way to finish third which had never happened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think part of that's just expectation. I think we'd limit ourselves mentally um, in, in like in everything we do, um, whether it's, you know, you and your personal life or, or whatever. I mean, we we're always putting mental limits on what we think we can do. So, so I'm an, I was an outsider coming in probably a little arrogant and, or a lot arrogant thinking that, you know what, I'm really a major factor in what's going to happen. So my expectation is we were going to maybe compete for the conference title in the first year. And, uh, and we got to the conference tournament and we were able to compete and we lost, as I recall, to, to a good Concordia team at the time. And, and Marion ended up uh, winning the league. But um, yeah, I think you take small steps, small, small steps in a positive direction and see where things go. And, and uh, I, think I commend our players. Competitive people view it as arrogance and competitive people view it as believing in themselves. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate you saying that because I, I do think I think it's I think it's a mindset. I just think, um, you know, I, I share this with our hitters a lot of times. Um, 
you had cited some of the some of the statistics I had. I I hit four fifty six one year, four fifty six, and 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 it was a goal for me because the guy who held the record for a single season was four fifty two. So I I obtained my goal. I hit four fifty six, but I didn't hit four fifty eight or five hundred because my goal was four fifty two. So. By, by the very nature of that exercise, goal setting, I set my limits. And I think humans and most athletes probably set their, their sights too low. And I know there's the old ad, adage about setting them high enough uh, to challenge you, but low enough to obtain them. But I think it's just a one-way to deal. I think most of the time we, we lower our expectations um, and, and we don't shoot for what we're capable of doing because in many cases, we don't even know what we're capable of doing. And, uh, and I was a fresh mind and thought we could do good things. And I think they came along for the ride. Yeah. Just the mindset piece for me is the, the most fascinating part of all of this. When you look at successful people at every level, they have a certain mindset that the people that aren't successful don't have. And I've, I've gone round and round with the goal setting piece too, because, exactly what you said it's like okay yeah you might set a goal and if you reach it so then you have to reevaluate and i just think sometimes you worry about the wrong things with goal setting rather than yeah, trying yeah, to be yeah, as, as yeah. great as you possibly can be and then let the chips fall where they may and figure it out after that yeah i i think one of the challenges uh programs that have had success you know struggle with is um, you stop applauding all the intermediate steps to greatness. So for us now, it's just, if you don't win a national championship, we have a bad year. Like we're disappointed. We're walking away frustrated, upset. You lose that game in a regional, you're, you're crushed, man. I mean, and, and I think, um, you know, looking at that, I, I, I don't think we do a good enough job. And I'm put, putting myself at the top of when I say we, Maybe we need to continue to applaud those small steps, whether it's a conference title or or a regional berth. Um, you know, they become expected, and because they become expected, I think they're often taken for granted. And um, and I don't know the answer. Uh, I just have more questions. Um, but they call it savoring. Uh, so, That's a gratitude yeah, thing. They call there it you savoring, go. Yeah. trying to savor all of those moments, whether it's a win. Because again, as we all know, they're not they're not easy to come by at times. So yeah, they do call yeah. it savoring as far as savoring those, those small wins. I like that. I but, like you that. know, your brain, you get what you focus on. So, hey, we won a game, so let's focus on that and how good that felt. And then you'll probably get more of that rather than focus on some of the negative pieces of it. And, again, that's part of tricking your mind too. But I just I think people lose sight of, of the journey sometimes because they focus so much on on whether it's things out of their control or negatives rather than really trying to savor those po positive moments. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's part yeah, of re-engaging too, trying to re-engage with the process because obviously it's easy to get complacent. You guys have won a lot of games. It's easy for people to get complacent and, and just expect that it's going to happen rather than, okay, here's the things that we have to do to, to allow this to happen, but enjoy that, that part of it too. And you also forget the, um, the amazing championship plays that occurred in order to get you to the next step, right? You, you, you remember winning a lot of games throughout the course, but you don't remember that, you know, what Ryan did in the third inning, man, that was the critical element to winning that game that to take us to, to the championship game. So you, you sometimes forget about that, and I, I love what you're saying, man. I'm I'm uh, putting that in the coaching manual. We're gonna start savoring a lot of things here. I guy stole that from Jay Johnson, who's at LSU now. So he he started when he was at Arizona. They were doing like team photos. I think he started at at, at Reno too, but they did a team photo after every win, just basically and nice. put it out there. Which so I stole that from him. But that was kind of one like of those that. things like yeah. savor savor a win here and enjoy it and then yeah the next day you got to get back to work but you know enjoy when good things happen and and enjoy that part of it and then hopefully it keeps yeah coming. yeah love it i love it now i mean you caught but obviously the the newer stuff that's out now i mean how much have you adjusted with some and and probably there were some still old stuff i mean tony pena caught on a knee benito santiago caught on a knee i mean there were guys doing it back then you know how much of the newer stuff have you dabbled with with your catchers 
Yeah, I just I just spoke in uh, at a convention in Austria and, and talked exactly that. And I brought those two people up because I, I grew up on those two two guys. So it's been around a long time. I think at the end of the day, um, there's some small changes. And I, I've got it narrowed down to these two things. Number one, glove movement is allowed. It used to not be allowed. So now it's allowed. But they're still trying to do the same thing we were trying to do back in the day which is put the pocket back in the zone to make it appear to be a strike. Uh, And before, if you're doing it, you were viewed as a scoundrel for trying to trick me. And if you do it again, you aren't going to get another strike. Now it's like, okay. So, so from a standpoint of moving up to the ball, you know, anytime your glove bangs out of the zone, it's going to be tough to call it a strike. So we're always moving the glove back into the zone. And I, I love, I love all of that. I sometimes wonder for some of the less capable guys, the, the, the bigger the move they have to make, sometimes the consistency is not there. So I struggle a little bit with that. Um, but that would be the, the, you know, the framing piece from the one knee standpoint. I, I love one knees most of the time. Um, I don't know we're good enough yet or talented enough or I'm good enough teaching that that I still see a significant range reduction. In critical situations, so. Uh, you're down on a knee and it's a ball way up and out. I think they struggle to get to that one. Or if the block is in their frame and you're on a knee, you're fine. It actually makes a lot of sense. But when it goes outside, I still think in general, in general, um, th- there's there's a reduction in range. So I, I worry about those two things. So I, I'd say most of our guys are are one knee guys uh, in in certain times. Uh, in certain situations and certain counts, and then and then they probably move to a different stance that they can work work off of. Uh, and of course, our pitchers are a little less consistent, so you always got to be ready to to you know to um, catch the ball that gets away from a pitcher. And and I think that's still part of winning games. Uh, so we haven't confirmed uh, converted fully to just you know. All kinds of various There's stances, too many but variables. I, it's just like everything else yeah. in baseball. There's too many variables. There's no black and white, and it's it's what's best for your individual program and and your players. So you know, it's just I, I put that variables. in the in the jump lead category. Like, if 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 I had a way of teaching all of the catchers to to catch from one knee and block as effectively as they do from two two uh, two knees up then I'd probably be selling that. Otherwise, I'm probably tailing it a little bit to the individual. Same thing with jump leads, right? I don't know if all my guys are comfortable jump leading. We'll, we'll introduce it. We'll try to work on it. We'll try to, you know, you know teach it. But, but there's some guys that are good at it, and there's some guys that are pathetic at it. So um, The Diamondbacks that, were a good is, example on the base running side this year of they had traditional guys. You know, you look at Corbin, he's really fast. He was traditional base dealer. They had some vault. They had some jumping. It just yeah, again, yeah. it depends on the on the individual. Some guys are fast enough where they can stay in a traditional and and steal from there. Some guys need a little bit of head start. And I like that it's kind of gotten to sh- closer to the base and then working into it. It's almost like the leads at second that everybody's taught when you're trying to steal third, where it's a little closer and work out. And if you get a running start, then go because you probably got it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the only thing I, I would I would say that I still question in our how how we developed our base running is i think at the core of our base running is really the the perception of aggressiveness and and you you develop that perception from being aggressive certainly but once you've established that you know how far you're off the base also affects the the quality of the pitches you get so i mean a lot of the stuff i think we're trying to do at the bases might hopefully impact the guy in the mound and if we can get more pitches to hit then we've done our job, whether we move to this next base or not. So it's it's a fine line. I I don't have it down perfectly yet. We're still working on, you know, where we want to be with this as a as a program. Um, but but I do know this: uh, the better players always seem to be easier to coach. Man, I mean, you know, some of our best hitters. Man, I feel really good about how I taught him how to hit so great. And uh, and and our worst guys, you know they must not be listening, you know? So um, at the core of all of this, it's still, you got to give the credit to the players, man. When they, when they do the things they do, um, you know, that's because they're great athletes and they've, they've worked hard at it. 
When you start in the fall, do you start with individuals or do you start full team? Yeah, we we uh, we do full team. Our first uh, our first several weeks, we still have an open tryout. We're public school, so we still have an open tryout that might last only a couple of days. Um, and then and then we're really trying to get them to compete and evaluate um, how how the summer was. For some people, they come back ready to go. Sometimes uh, they come back not so great, and uh, so we're really trying to evaluate some of our new guys against some of our old guys, and that's best. Uh, when they're competing. So we'll, we'll jump into competition pretty much right away. Our pitchers won't throw a lot of pitches, but they will be on a mound competing against hitters early. And then as we start sorting some of that out, the competition piece, then we'll move into uh, uh, individual work as we progress through um, because we always can go indoors with, with individual work later. So that's how we do it. Um, I know most of the most of the big time D ones kind of start slowly in the fall, right? The and they do some individual stuff. Though. Yeah, right. And they can when they, we were at Iowa, it was the same something. thing. Like f- with our facilities, we had to to go earlier, and then once it yeah. got cold, we went yeah. to Indies. And yeah. I liked the That's individual exactly right. por- portion at the end. I know, I know. There's other places out there they they can stay out until November, so they're going to do it different. It's closer to their season. I just liked the team component a little bit earlier and then get back to give them time to get back to individuals yeah, just to work yeah. on the things that they learned through the yeah. fall campaign. And as you say that, it, it probably is predicated mostly on weather. Um, our fall is the best time of the year for baseball here, as you know. So um, September, October, man, that's good stuff. Um, and, uh, and we want to use it for, for our ability to play. I mean, what are some indoor tips – there's a lot of coaches that listen in that have to deal with being indoors practicing. Well, I'll, I'll give you my epiphany after last year. Um, the And this is going to seem obvious to you, but um, we've overvalued metrics. Okay. Um, last year, we were the best metric team in our league. No doubt. Ability to run, throw across the infield, you know, Hit, hit with power, exit speed. Man, you talk, we were the best metric team in our league. All right. But we weren't very good at getting the guy in from second. We weren't get very good at uh, playing good defense behind our pitchers. We weren't very good at changing speeds and pitching. Um, we could throw 90 something, but, you know, there's more to the game than just throwing hard. So, so what, what I've tried to do is modify what we're training to, to address it. So, We'll still continue our development work, chase metrics, but we'll always back that up with some type of gameplay, competition play. And we're doing, we've always done it, but I'm just saying You're my epiphany was it. we have to do it more. You're we have to do it more. We have to, we have to explain to them that at the end of the game, game's won because you get knocked the guy in from second base. Uh, the game was won because that one, you only got one ball in nine innings but it was a ball and a gap that you had to be on time to go track down and make the play. Um, it, you don't even have to throw that ball in at 95. You just catch it. Just, you know, that's all you have to do. So, so I think that's kind of our thing. And, and as you look at what goes on indoors, I think indoors naturally uh, lends itself to the development piece, to the metric piece, a lot of ground balls, a lot of reps. And, and I think uh, maybe where some of the Northern schools have been ahead is that we, I believe we have time to break some of the, the basic skill stuff down more because we're stuck inside, right? We're stuck inside. So, um, so we've been spending a lot of time just with, with, uh, you know, our feet and our hands and our arm and, and, uh, making sure we have ample range and the ability to react. Um, so, and of course the space is, is, is part, part what you have to discover and your staff, how many do you have? equipment cages all those things go into how you structure practice but um i do think the indoors gives you a lot more time to train uh i guess fundamental skills and metric skills and that's why getting back to your first question we've spent so much of our time in the fall now really on gameplay trying to give them the opportunity to actually compete and figure that piece out we used to flip sides I, i i got smarter as we went along at Western trying to figure out facility, what worked, but we actually, as we got closer to playing someone else, we actually flipped sides like we did in a game. So they would hit, 
And then once the pitcher got through a set, they'd go do defense, just like in a game. They'd get their arm back yep. up. They'd yep. sprint. So we basically just started flipping, just like in a game. Especially for our position players, I felt like it helped them get their arms and legs acclimated to the season because it's it's, yep. it's yep. not easy, but – I just felt like that helped us when we started flipping sides like we did in a game just to help them acclimate a little bit more and make yeah, it more competitive yeah. too. And that's another great point, you know, and my, my, my struggle with that is probably my OCD or something. My waste <laughs> of time. Cause, cause you know what I mean? Like you're trying to be, well, and you're limited with your on time, time too. Like you're, you're, right. You guys and are and you're trying to be limited on time, but we have plenty of time to do that. For me, it's just like, there's that little dead period of time in practice. I'd like to, I'd like to soak it up somehow and and soaking it up isn't always beneficial to how we play the game. So another good point, man. I got that, and I'm going to start savoring more wing, wins. Hey, obviously you handled it great as a player overseas. Who, who approached you about going to coach overseas? Um, boy, just just my contacts through the years. So I've been fortunate for a couple reasons. Um, I started getting involved in in a company, uh, a nonprofit called International Sports Group. And uh, it's been around for a long, long time. Nice right now, it's spearheaded by Tom O'Connell, who you it's know, and and it's a great deal. I, I was thrown into that in like 2004, one of my first years, and so I'm on a staff with Tom O'Connell and Joe Madden. How about that? And then the next year, I'm on a staff with uh, Gene Tennis, the Whammy, you know, and uh, and of course, I already had that drive because of the ABCA. I mean, like I used to like. That was a place. I can't wait for January, right? To go there and and sit down and listen to people, and then and then go talk in a corner with someone, and then argue about whatever one leg catching. And I mean, that's that's uh, that's. So I got stuck in with that, and from that experience, along with playing, I met a lot of people in Europe. And I think, like everything in life, now I'm starting to find out it's about the connections you make and the relationships you build. And uh, because of that, I, I, I started knowing all about what's going on out there. And I found out there was a team, uh, you know, over there and and uh, we communicated with them. And next thing I know, I'm playing over there. So and now I know I know individuals that run teams all over Europe. Um, and uh, we've had I think we've had eight of our players that have moved over and played professionally over there. Um, you know, most recently. Um, there's a guy who, who played at, uh, uh, in the state, but from my hometown by the name of Vinny Rotino, Do you know, that name at all. He was in the Brewers organization, played for the Brewers for maybe a year, year and a half. Um, and then now he's there one of their announcers uh, on, on the TV on Bally's. And anyway, I'm in Europe. I I'm listening to an Italian coach speak. He's the national team coach. Um, a guy named Marco M Maseretti and, uh, and he's the the was not this past year, but several years ago, he was the national team coach. And he and he and I started talking about Vinny Rotino, a guy we both both knew. And that's what happens in the baseball community. You start making those connections and uh, you realize how much there is to gain uh, knowledge wise. And so that's kind of what happened to me. I just and it, ISG was a big, big part of that, man. We go. There's probably 10 clinics a year that we send coaches out there. Um you know, to coach. And I think it's great for the game, but I think it's even better for national relations, you know, world relations. I think that's really what we do. And, and that's why I really applaud Tom for, for staying with this, this nonprofit. I mean, Pete, Pete Caliendo. Yeah. Pete Caliendo. There you go. Yeah. What does it mean to you going into the ABC hall of fame? Um, for me, it's a little surreal. You know, I mean, like, I don't feel like I'm old, you know, like I, I like I, I remember some of my early um, trips to the ABCA. You know what I'm saying? I like I, re I remember vividly the ABCA and, um, you know, there were always these these majestic kind of people that, you know, I don't know. I never expected I even meet them, let alone going to a hall of fame where they're included in it. So for me, it's kind of a surreal thing. You know, it's like the, probably the, the baseball version of if you were an actor going and, and hanging out with Al Pacino, right? Like someone noticed that you did okay. And, and you may not be Al Pacino, but at least you're like, got your name next to him. That's pretty cool. So for me, it's just a surreal experience. 
Um, I also am old enough, which I think, you know, that's why you guys have these parameters about age and, and longevity because that does matter. And I've gone from, I think, early in my career thinking it was it was something I could do. It was me and and now realizing how many people along the way put me here. You know what I mean? And and I, I don't say that as a as a marketing ploy. It's it's real stuff, man. I mean, you know, I think sometimes you hear that stuff and you're like, oh yeah, he's just saying it. But it's true, like in a big way. Um, everything from, you know, the coaches that I've coached, played for, and and then most recently Jim Miller, who was here for many, many years, who took me under his wing. And then, you know, like um Charlie Green Sr. Do you know Charlie Green Sr.? He's in our so Charlie Green Sr. Yeah, so so you know, he, he was I guess young when I first met him. Um, and uh I meet him at an airport and we're gonna go do something for ISG and and uh, I, of course, I'm the younger guy. So I said, Coach Green, let me grab your bag. And I go down and I grab his bag thinking it'd be OK and light. Well, he's got he's got 200 of his books in there and I barely can move it. And ever since that day, you know, he's one of my favorite guys in the whole wide world, man. So um, so, I mean, I, I it's surreal, but it's it's really a special experience. And I, I thank all you guys for for the opportunity. Any other shout outs you want to give that maybe you won't get to during the three to five minutes? You know, I'm going to limit my shout outs because usually what happens is you forget someone, you know, and uh, uh, so we're going to keep it very simple. Uh, I plus, think I start speech, crying. Once I start thanking people, then I start crying. So I have to, yeah, no, I that's to not, limit my that's, thanks. So because once I start thanking people, then I start getting emotional. I mean, you could, you you know, I, I in the other other thing is I've sat sat in the seats long enough that um, everyone in the room deserves an opportunity to to enjoy the night. And uh, you know, if I start at my eight year old coach Jack Harrison, who absolutely was instrumental, man, it's going to be a long night, right? And we got stuff to do. We some of us want to go see speakers and other things, so. I'm going to try to keep it short and tight and and, and not offend anyone because uh, at the end of the day, I do got to thank some people because that's why I'm here, right? So, um, but I'm going to keep that list short and tight. I hope so anyway. So you start, you talked about making adjustments for this year with this year's team. When do you start kind of that reflection piece from the past season trying to get ready for the next season? Yeah, that, that was in September or the first day. You know, um, and I would say it probably was a little bit of reminiscent of, of Augie Garrido. You know, we don't finish third. I don't know what you guys are doing here, but I'm not finishing third. That's not what we do. So um, and once again, there's always better ways and other ways to look at it. But that's how we start on day one. Everyone in, the, in our dugout knew that we were better than how we finished. And once again, you could sit there and say 30 wins. Great year. All good. But man, when you're sitting when you're sitting at home, you know, for the first time, when you want to be playing in an NCAA tournament, you know, you, you got to reflect on that. So it's it happened day one for us, and once again, you try to do it in a positive way, right? We're not trying to belittle anyone; it's no one's fault. But look, look, we got to get better. It has to start today. So that started then, and then it'll it'll kind of refresh itself. With some new, with some new ideas and new, new attitude, um, you know, when we start back in January. Do you have? And a, once again, some, some of that stuff I'm going to have to. I'm still. I'll zoom in. Still some, I, I talk to teams, so I'll, I'll yeah. zoom in with your guys. We can talk about. Yeah, it. we can talk. Well, about good. It. I, I'm going to track you down at the ABCA then I because love uh, I love st- part of part of part of that time is it opens up those those gaps and what you're thinking, you know, about hey, how do I, what are we going to do this year? So. The, the timing of the ABCA is like always been for me a perfect timing, you know, right, right prior to where we got to get going. So do you, do you have a favorite again, moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now helped you move forward? <sighs> Clarify that. What do you, what do you mean by that? Like everybody's got to answer this one. I just like asking successful people this question because I think what, non-successful people view as failures successful people view as learning moments yeah yes certainly that's true and i know a lot of people coined it as you know two types of people right losers and learners but um 
you know what what was a, a, a pinnacle year for me was 04. Um, 04 was a pinnacle year for me because, or a very important year for me because um, I was unhappy. I, I, I like was miserable. We lost in the bottom of the ninth inning. I was miserable. And, uh, and I was not easy to be around. Like in hindsight, my wife explains that to me. And I, I realized then that our self-worth and who we are as people and how we go about our business can't be tied so closely to the wins and the losses. And I think as young coaches, they take everything personally. And I'm not saying you shouldn't take some things personally. If you're running a program, man, that's your program. You, you, you have to be doing the job. Um, but I do think it was the first time for me that I understood that, you know, you can only control what you can and how you prepare and all those things. Um, and, and I knew it was going to be a long career and I was going to be miserable for a lot of years. I mean, if you're only happy when you win a national championship and you're miserable the rest of the time, something has to change. And I don't know if I fully have the balance between wanting it in a, at all costs and, and still understanding we're doing a good job for the student athletes and, and our staff and our university that balance is a tough thing for me to find. So I look forward to talking to you at the ABCA about how we might be able to find that together. Yeah, but obviously you let it go because you win it the next year, and that's part of it. I think you get challenged by the universe on some things to where if you hold on to it too tight, like you're never going to get it, and eventually you have to release it and let it go. And then I think once you start to trust and let things go, then I think it starts bringing you the things that you want. But I think so many times we, we try to fight it and, and force it, to where it's like, okay, you've got to, it's trying to teach you something right now to where you have to let this go because I, you obviously let it go between 04 and 05. You found a way to release that last season because you guys won it then the next year. Yeah. Yeah. But then 06, I was a little miserable. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you get, and so you're always recreating, you know, your mindset and what you're, what you're about. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's, yeah. So I, I'll, I'll look, I'll look to pick your brain again then. If you don't mind. What about your routines? I love asking about routines too. Do you have any evening or morning routines that you do that you like that help help you engage, keep your battery personally? charged? Yeah, personally. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big guy. I, I think first of all, the, the the goal setting thing, you know, went on the wayside a long time ago because because where I, where I saw our athletes falling short was not in their goals. If if you ask them to it was the execution of their goals or, or put another way, the habits that they create on a daily basis. And, you know, and, and then I read a book years ago and then I read another book and they're the same darn book. It was the, the habits of effective people or successful people. It was originally wrote by Stephen Covey. And then a couple of years later, my, my son's reading the book and I said, it's the same book, just the son wrote it now. Right. And, uh, and it made, made habits come back to the top. So for me, Waking up and getting to the to the gym is is a big thing. I find myself more energized throughout the rest of the day, kind of like you know that segment on YouTube that went viral about making your bed. I feel like I've accomplished something early. It got my mind working. Um, so so that's a, a big thing for me. Is I think um, you know starting early in the morning, you know get getting to the gym, spending an hour there. How many days a week are you going to the gym? Almost every day. Me too. I have to. Yeah, almost like, every day. It just I, once I get off when, of it, it's not good. I got sick. And yeah, I got off of it for a little bit. Honestly. Yeah, I know yeah. I and the sick. the other thing for me that that uh, like I said, how old are you? I'm 49. See, I knew you were younger than me because we we're doing. The, I was doing the math yeah, but in my you head. Still but still look young too. Like that's the thing. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. example of why you need to do that every day because it's going to keep from a longevity piece. It's going to keep you looking yeah. younger, feeling younger. You have and to, what I, and what it's I was not easy, say with that not is, easy, but you said it, you, you've developed that yeah. habit. Your, your brain and body are on overdrive. When you get up in the morning, your body knows and brains knows that you're going to the gym. So like, you don't even think about it anymore. Like you just, yeah. you developed a great habit that you don't even have to think about anymore because that routine has been built up to get to that point. Chefs call it mise en place. That's one of the things. What is talk. it called? It's called mise en place. Chefs do this when, when elite okay. chefs. When they're going to cook, they lay all of their equipment out in the exact same spot in rotation, and so it becomes automatic for them when they cook because everything is laid out 
in a, it's a French yeah. French term for mise en place. Yeah. It just means everything I like in its that. place. Everything in its place. The, so yeah. when you yeah. when you translate yeah. that from French, it means everything in its place. Yeah. And, and for me, the other thing I was going to say, because you probably don't, you haven't got there yet, but I'm stiff and sore and my neck is not good and I'm moving slowly and it's just not good. And and for me, it's like the movement gets me to feel better. Yes. I wake up with a neck ache. I wake up with a leg ache. I wake up with something not feeling exactly right. If I get to the gym and I move and I get through some movements and I do some stuff, you know, stretching this dynamic movement thing is, is the stretching piece for me is great. Like, uh, so anyway, I, even if you just got reason. that in, I try to tell people, I'm like, even right, if you just right. went to yeah. the gym and did a dynamic warm up for five to 10 minutes and then left, that's still better than, be okay. than not being there. Yeah. 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 Hey, do you, let me ask you a question quick. Um, You're old enough. Have have you seen the cycle of of what has been emphasized throughout? Like for me, it's deja vu, right? It's like now we have an emphasis of of yoga again. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I remember that thirty years ago, we we're that was big, right? And and then um, you know, it's like, do you feel like we're in a, a endless just, cycle with I think what people we people forget? I think it happens with coaching too. I think you forget sometimes maybe what works. I think that's why the convention is good because I think it reminds you maybe of maybe something you forgot along the way. I, you know, for me, there's always been kind of that ebb and flow. If you look at the big league level too, like something will be new and shiny and then you'll get back to it. Like everybody threw, threw the short game or action offense yeah. under the table yeah. and look what the D-backs did this year, you know, there was more bunning this year. There's more stealing. And I think sometimes people forget what is actually good and, and fundamental and what you need to stay with because I think people get distracted on what is new. And you said it with the, the building habits books. Like if you pick up any building habit book, they're all about the same, but somebody will repackage it. And I think that happens in the baseball community and with coaching too, where, okay, it's new. Well, it's actually not new. It, it was going on 30 years ago. You talk about one and catching, like, there's so many things with hitting, with pitching. I think people just repackage it with new phrasing where it's, okay, that's things that we've yeah. always done. I mean, yeah. Gary Ward for me was one of the most scientific hitting coaches of yeah. all time. I think his language was was crazy at times. But if you look at what Gary Ward did throughout his career, I mean, the right, interlocking right. sequence of parts was the name of that yeah. video. The sequential, the sequential, sequential interlocking of, sequence of, of parts. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, but it made sense. Connection made sense. I still do that with youth campers. I'll have them touch their back to their back of their shoulder. That's a Gary Ward thing. This I'm sure a parent thinks I'm I'm earth shattering trying to get his kid to tap or you know son or daughter to tap the back of their shoulder with the barrel. But Gary Ward was right, talking right. about that in the '70s. And I think the last time he spoke at the ABCA. It was it, it was re revolution resolution. Was that it? Do you remember that? That might have been the last year. I don't know. That was I don't know fifteen years ago. But yeah, he's always been a privilege to listen to too. But I think that's where you have to keep a, a binder. You have to mm -hmm. you have to keep those reminders of what works for yourself individually, for your players, for your program. I think you have to have those reminders because if not, then we will forget. And when I talk to players individually we have them journal and and track everything because some weeks you're going to feel better than others and if you don't right, track right. all of that stuff then it's just you're riding the ups and downs of that performance where okay i felt really good october 1st to october 8th i'm going to go back and look what i was doing that entire week from a nutrition standpoint sleep standpoint and and really fundamentally it still goes back to sleep nutrition and exercise if if any person can yeah. stay on top of that and yes it's boring and it's hard to do but i think if any person can stay on top of their sleep their nutrition hydration and their exercise you're gonna be in pretty good shape now it's not yeah. easy to yeah. do and people talk about it so you have to go out and do it but i think if you can build those daily habits i think the rest of it becomes a little bit easier but that's just yeah, my yeah. personal. So I'll get my point. soapbox yeah. now. Yeah. Any what are final thoughts or something I should have asked before I let you go, John? No, you did a great job. I'm I'm I you know, I could I could sit and talk to you all day. 
So I, I really enjoyed it and, and thank you for your time and look forward to talking to you again soon, man. It, it's, it's been a great day. Go crush it in Dallas. I don't, I, I can never go cause I got to run the hot stoves. So I'm, I'm yeah. this year's class is, uh, I think it's probably maybe up there with one of the best ones we've ever had. When you look top to bottom of everybody that's going in from the different levels and guys still coaching too. Like, I think that's the cool thing is, you know, we got you, we got Jeff Willis, we got Brian O'Connor, we got guys that are still coaching Danny Hall. Um, I think yeah, it's cool yeah. that, that we got some guys going in that are still doing it. Um, but yeah. uh, as I said, you got to savor it, savor, savor the evening. It's a tough thing because like, I by no means feel like I'm done, you know, like, no, and those guys don't either. Know, like, that's a cool thing. Right. You know like, what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I think you get I, to um, enjoy it a little bit more that way. Like, okay, you're still coaching. You've reached the, our, it's our Oscars. You mentioned acting. I think this is our Oscars, yeah. but you still get an opportunity yeah. to go out and still do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, a friend of mine gave me one of those wristbands and he must've got it from one of the booths at the ABCA. Um, but it was be legendary. And I think that for me, that's like, yeah, if you're going to go into the Hall of Fame, then you, you better you better be pretty good when we start in January. You know what I'm saying? So um, so for me, it's it's a very once again, very motivational time. Uh, you know, I've, I've listened to the ABCA for many, many years, I went to all the conventions and, and it, it's a great, great organization. And for me, it's a another piece of motivation. Right. It's just, hey, thank you for the award. But now now I got to prove that I deserve it, you know until I finally walk away one day. Well, and you think about the relationships, you know, through the ABCA, you talked about Tom O'Connell, like it just, you go down for all of us, the relationships that all of us have developed in just that four day period that you come out of, again, I, I say it all the time, like you find your tribe there. Like if you've never been, what's the first time? I love the first timers that come because you don't know what you don't know. And then when they get there, it's like, oh, yes, this is where I should have been a long time ago. I have two on my staff this year Love that it. are first timers. So so uh, they, they we actually just met and they were asking me what it's going to be like. Tell them to come to the rookie mentorship uh, meeting Thursday night that Paul Blanchard runs. So Paul Blanchard, another yeah, great legend. Minnesotan. But that panel yeah. is great. We have a lot of fun. That's my favorite thing of the convention is that Thursday night because it's Is that after the divisional meeting? Yes. Starts at nine. Starts at nine. We yeah. usually go to about midnight because there's a lot of questions, but it just it's a really good kickoff to the whole thing because it allows them to get all their questions answered for the most part. Till they shut us out. Okay. Yeah. They kicked us yeah. out in Chicago. Good. We were going too long. Yeah, yeah. Hey, do you remember the the Dallas one that we woke up? It was seventeen degrees. Yes. Yep. Like I don't know what year that was. That had to have been two or three Dallas's ago. But I remember waking up and the only time ever I think that I, Wisconsin was forty degrees and Dallas was seventeen. Yeah, people are so like Dallas. Are I'm like some of the coldest games I've ever played were in Dallas, Fort Worth, playing TCU, UT Arlington. I, I mean, it was like fifteen degrees one year when we played TCU <laughs> down there my sophomore year. Their heater worked yeah. in their dugout, and ours didn't. Nolan Ryan's son was pitching on that team at TCU. By the way, yeah, so. yeah, that's that's something, man. It's a good memory. <laughs> All right, well, sir. Thanks again. Safe travels. Right. Appreciate you. Thanks, man. Right. We'll yep. see you soon. You All bet. Right. Bye bye.